Hi lovely viewers, it's me again, your one and only Mtati Mpundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you lovely viewers. I shall repeat this. This was to finance drought response interventions to resume servicing of the restructured external debt and dismantling of the costly fuel areas. It should be noted that even after restructuring, Madam Speaker, very important, our country is still carrying a heavy debt burden from the past years of extravagance. We appreciate the House for passing the supplementary budget to make this possible. Thank you to the members of parliament in this house. Madam Speaker, the global economy in which Zambia is finally, is firmly intertwined, is experiencing difficulties that include rising inflation and high interest rates across the globe, leading to shortage of capital as well as the depreciation of currencies. This, together with domestic challenges, is negatively affecting the cost of living of our people. Our government will continue to work diligently to address the issue of the cost of living, to alleviate the challenges, the difficulties that our people are facing as a consequence of these parameters outlined above. Again, our hearts are with our people, the people of Zambia. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, we are putting in place multiple measures to address these issues. Madam Speaker, we will now proceed to highlight the achievements we have made under the policy measures that we'll, we will pursue or we continue to pursue in line with our national development agenda as espoused in the eighth national development plan. Our administration continues to implement key macroeconomic reforms, necessary reforms, difficult painful but necessary for us to heal, for us to turn the corner. These macro restructuring measures and others are essential, Madam Speaker. I make this point emphatically because there is no way out other than through these measures that we have put in place if we want longevity in success in our country. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, our administration is working and working hard. Following the reaching of agreements with the Official Creditors Committee. Official Creditors Committee, Madam Speaker, the House, the country needs to be aware that the debt was in four components. One, official creditors, if you want to call it bilateral creditors. Two, euro bonds. Three, commercial creditors. Four, domestic arrears. These are the four categories that we've been dealing with just for ease of reference, so that as we go through our presentation, we can put context to what we're saying. So therefore, following the reaching of agreements with the Official Creditors Committee and the Euro bond holders, we are glad to inform this August House that our government has since resumed servicing of the external debt since defaulting in 2022. We are now back on track. We have restored our country's credibility in the international financial system, no doubt about it. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Minister of Finance and National Planning will soon present the 2025 national budget to this August House. The budget will outline specific policy measures to safeguard macroeconomic stability, restore and maintain debt sustainability. Remember, climate change has brought factors that were not incorporated in our calculation of debt sustainability. So we are working hard to take this into account. Very important, Madam Speaker, that we remain on top of the gains that we've made. Um, so as, as, as we address our economic, social economic challenges, we take account of all of these variables so that we do a smart professional job, difficult as it may be. We request this August House 
to support the budget once it's tabled in this house. Madam Speaker, economic transformation and job creation. Madam Speaker, in our last address, we announced measures to stimulate maize production. These included the increase in the maize purchasing price, in the floor price, to make farmers viable at the farm gate. Otherwise, you won't have maize. There will be no maize if you didn't address those issues. So we had to address that issue to ensure that the maize floor prices are attractive to producers. Establishment of an agricultural credit window and guaranteeing a ready market for early maize production. Our people responded, Madam Speaker, favorably by planting a record 2.2 million, 2.2 million hectares of land under maize cultivation compared to 1.83 million, 1.8 million hectares in the previous season. As a consequence of the severe drought we experienced in the 2023-2024 agricultural season, only 684,000 hectares out of the 2.2 million uh, hectares, which is only 31% of the area planted was harvested. Disaster indeed. Disaster indeed. This significantly reduces, reduced the maize production to 1.5 million tons from an expected harvest of 4.4 million tons. This largely, Madam Speaker, is the cause of the current challenges in food security. The nation needs to be aware of that. We commend our citizens, Madam Speaker, for their remarkable response to the call to grow more maize and food in general. Thank you to the citizens who responded positively. It must remain positive, however. Madam Speaker, to cover the maize deficit, we're importing maize from some neighboring countries. And that's normal. That's normal. We want to reassure our people that no one will go hungry. In our country, our citizens, wherever they are, wherever they are, across the 10 provinces, 116 districts, 156 constituencies. We are your keepers. We are interested in your welfare. That's why you elected us into office. So this is our assurance, Madam Speaker. No one will go hungry in our country during this challenging period. At least some food will be available. To further mitigate the effects of the drought, we are encouraging the cultivation of winter and early maize by all our farmers, including those who have never produced any food in their life. This is the time to give it a try because the country needs food. Government will soon contract farmers to supply early maize to be delivered by April 2025, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, to promote resilience among smallholder farmers amid climate change, government is providing affordable financing for the mechanization and the necessary irrigation, precision irrigation, more importantly. We, as a government, are conscious that mechanization, irrigation will help us to improve, increase the quantum of production, and more importantly, to improve productivity. The two are different but we're interested in both as a government. Madam Speaker, the sustainable agricultural financing facility with irrigation will enable our farmers to grow crops all year round. There will be nothing called a planting season. Every month is a planting season. Every month is a harvest month. That is where we should be going. In the 2024-2025 agriculture season, the financing facility will be enhanced to the tune of 1.2 billion kwacha from 400 million kwacha in the 2023-2024 <coughs> agriculture season. <coughs> this is in order to include additional crops, livestock, and aquaculture. It is gratifying to note that the number of participating banks in this facility 
Madam Speaker, has increased from five last year to nine now, and more are expected to come on board. <clears throat> to improve productivity among our farmers, we have continued to expand coverage of extension services countrywide. Madam Speaker, for the forthcoming season, the, distribu <coughs> <coughs> me. the distribution of inputs under the Farmer Input Support Program FISIP will be carried out using the e voucher system in 74 districts. 74 districts. <coughs> and the direct input support or supply system in 42 districts, benefiting over a million farmers across the country. The benefits of the e voucher model are that it empowers farmers to choose inputs best suited to their specific needs and supports job creation in our rural areas by increasing market participation of the suppliers and credible, credible agro-dealers. Madam Speaker, the growth of the livestock subsector has long been constrained by the disease outbreaks. Government has therefore intensified efforts in fighting livestock diseases. We managed to control the outbreak of anthrax in eastern province, southern province, and western provinces towards the end of 2023. We have also highlighted, heightened, if you like, our vaccination campaign against the contagious bovine pleural pneumonia, African swine fever, anthrax, as well as foot and mouth diseases across the country. We are proud that, as a country, we are making progress in producing animal vaccines. For instance, by mid-August this year, 880,400 doses of anthrax vaccine had been produced locally within our country. We are determined to be self-sufficient in the production of vaccines, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the mining sector remains key in driving our economic growth, providing employment opportunities and revenue generation. Our administration is therefore resolved to bring all our mining assets, all our mining assets to full production in our quest to attain our target of 3 million tons of copper by 2031. We are pleased to report that most outstanding issues, Madam Speaker, as I sit here, from the last time I sat in this chair, we made commitments. And I'm pleased to inform, to report to you, the Speaker and the House, that most outstanding issues at Mopani Mine, at Konkola Copper Mines, have since been successfully resolved. The companies, Madam Speaker, the companies, the companies are now back in business. Yeah. After many years of dormancy, yeah. these companies are now back in business. Yeah. We must celebrate as a nation uh, this achievement. It's for the country. It's not for one individual or cabinet or UPND government. It's for the 20 million Zambians. It's for the 20 million Zambians. Madam Speaker, at Mopani Copper Mines, for instance, International Resources Holdings is investing a total of $1.1 billion, which is well on course. In fact, production has already started going up uh, within the shortest possible time. With respect to Concola Copper Mines, Vedanta Resources is expected to invest another U.S. $1.2 billion. Out of this amount, $250 million has already been paid to dismantle areas yeah. Yeah. or to contractors, yeah. suppliers, yeah. and services, including the local authorities yeah. who have now been able to pay their retirees yeah. and are moving towards providing services to residents yeah. of the cities. Wonderful indeed. Yeah. Further, China Non-Ferrous Metal Mining Corporation, CNMC, has begun investing U.S. $500 million yeah. in reviving yeah. production at 28 Shaft. Yeah. 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 In Luansha. Yeah. Yeah. 
in Luanza. Yeah. I went to Luanza. Yeah. I went to yeah. The dewatering of the mine, which is expected to take up to 21 months, has since commenced. Yeah. This will see 28 shafts and the Luanza community spring back to life after more than 20 years of dormancy. Mr. Spe Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, we need to acknowledge these developments so we can inject a positive spirit in our bodies and work even harder. In Chirilavombe, Lubambe is also on course to revive an investment from JCHX of $300 million. With the revival of these mining assets, Madam Speaker, the local economy on the Copper Belt yeah. is surely rebounding. Yeah. We are glad that Zambians continue to own a stake in all these assets through ZCCM IH. Yeah. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, other investments are being made in greenfield mines, in greenfield mines, distinguished from the brown fields. Yeah. Existing mines, brown fields. New mines, green fields. So other investments are being made in greenfield mines. These include the US $600 million Kitumba mine project by Sino Mine in Mumba district, which we opened. New mine. New mine, Madam Speaker. Just to inform the House that in Mumba district alone, in the last three years, this government has mobilized well over $800 million in Mumbai district alone and is beginning to work. And 2,500 jobs are online. Sure. Cobalt, Madam Speaker, Cobalt Metals, Cobalt Metals and our own company, ZCCM Investment Holdings, are developing a $2 billion mine in Mingomba in Chirilavombe. Yeah. Barrick Lumana, yeah. since we took office, Madam Speaker, Barrick was on their way out. They are now staying and they are developing a super pit worth $2 billion. Yeah. This super pit, Madam Speaker, in Northwestern Lumana is a game changer. It will mean a lot to our people there and our economy. Yeah. Other ongoing projects include Kasenseli Gold and Kalengwa Mine. Yeah. And Kalengwa Mine. Yeah. Also in the northwestern province, yeah. the new copper belt. Yeah. In fact, it's not a new copper belt because the copper belt province is rebounding. Yeah. So we have now two copper belt provinces. Yeah. One traditional copper belt, another northwestern. Equally important, equally important. So we, as well as the Mimbula Minerals in Chingola, we are on the upswing, Madam Speaker. Three million tons of copper is in sight. No question about it. Madam Speaker, in our last address, we announced that government would embark on a national geo, geological mapping. We announced in the last speech that your government will embark on a national geological mapping exercise to unlock the untapped potential of our minerals so that we don't rely on our farmers to discover minerals for us. We need to know what lies underground in an organized way. We are pleased, Madam Speaker, sitting here very pleased to announce to you, to this House and the nation, that the commencement of the High Resolution Area Geophysical Survey to explore minerals and groundwater deposits across the whole country has commenced. The mapping exercise will enhance our ability, Madam Speaker, to realize the true market value of our minerals and our natural resources. This is further expected to reduce exploration cost because now we will have the backbone data for any detailed exploration to take place and promote investment in the mining sector going forward. We call upon our citizens to support and cooperate with this exercise 
as the planes, low flying planes, 50 meters above the surface, go around. They are not enemy planes. They are your planes, fellow citizens, to discover value for yourselves. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the activities of illegal mining are a big challenge that our government is fully committed to addressing. This courage has resulted in needless loss of life, which we regret, Madam Speaker, and pose a significant threat to national security uh, of our country. To combat this, our government is ready and willing to issue mining licenses to Zambians and others and facilitate access to credit, enabling, further enabling them, miners, to meet necessary safety standards. So, Madam Speaker, legal mining is what we support. Safe mining is what we support. Yeah. And also capital plus access yeah. to market. We said so many years back, we are doing it now. And we need the cooperation of everybody so that we do a good job, a fair job. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, yeah. we will continue to apply the law and maintain order to eradicate illegal mining activities yeah. going forward. Yeah. And the matching orders have been given already to all agencies that should ensure safety security of our areas, including unwanted individuals operating in those areas. Yeah. So please, members of parliament, support that effort because it's happening in your constituencies. That's where the mines are. We therefore call upon all our traditional leaders, in addition to the members of parliament, in addition to the mayors, council chairpersons, in addition to councillors, elected officials, all of us. We are also calling upon our traditional leaders, our civil society, our church, to join forces with the government to stop illegal mining. Very important. Yeah. Madam Speaker, to support expansion in the agricultural production and other economic activities, government will continue to make land available to our people legally. Again, rule of law, legally. To land to our people legally and protect their rights to own land. We will work with our traditional leaders to ensure that all land, all land, whether state or traditional, customary, as the law may be defining it, it is protected from encroachment and other vices. No thuggery, no grabbing land illegally. This will not be tolerated going forward. Going forward, there is need to address land disputes. We will address land disputes so that land can be put to economic use, lifeline use for our communities, for the development of our country. Madam Speaker, tourism remains an important economic sector, creating jobs for our people, as well as foreign exchange and revenue for the country. In the first half of this year, international tourist arrivals tremendously increased, tremendously increased, yeah, yeah. as compared to the same period in 2023. Yeah. Progress is how you measure it. To encourage local tourism, government is actively engaging tourism establishments, tour operators, and other players in the sector to design attractive packages for our people to promote domestic tourism, domestic tourism, as well as international tourism. Madam Speaker, to promote the tourism sector and enhance its contribution to wealth and job creation, tourism promotion activities are being scaled up. In this regard, a number of traditional ceremonies were actively marketed and supported this past period. Yeah. Government has continued to market and promote Zambia as a tourist destination of choice in key tourism source markets. We will co also continue to promote tourism product development in partnership with the private sector, regional partners, global partners is also a matter that would encourage. Madam Speaker, the energy sector, which is an enabler of economic growth has been severely, as indicated already, affected by the drought. The electricity subsector, which is predominantly hydroelectric power, has experienced a significant decline 
in electricity generation due to low water levels. To mitigate these effects, effects of the drought on electricity generation, Madam Speaker, and the growing electricity deficit, yet demand is going up, government is implementing a number of interventions, a myriad of interventions, in a bid to enhance resilience and reduce our dependence on hydroelectric power, we are promoting alternative energy sources of electricity generation. To this end, we commissioned the construction, Madam Speaker, from a discussion table, but we finally commissioned the construction of 300 megawatts of thermal power plant in Mamba. Construction is going on day and night. This power plant is expected, Madam Speaker, to come on stream by mid-2026. Yeah. And this is firm power. This is best load. Very important. To diversify the energy mix further, Madam Speaker, the country's current power deficit and the current to address the current company, country's current power deficit, Zesco Limited, with various partners, including those from China, including those from China, and from different parts of the world. ZESCO is spearheading the development of several solar electricity projects. This is in addition to a number of private sector initiatives, which this government is encouraging and encouraging seriously. Any citizen, Madam Speaker, is invited to invest in the energy sector. We have reduced the regulatory burden, the time lost, so please come forward and for once run genuine businesses and you, are, you will be supported by your government. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, to boost an alternative energy sources further, government has issued the electricity net metering. I'm talking about, Madam Speaker, the operating environment to attract more investors in the sector. Your government has issued what we are calling net metering regulations of 2024. It's now in place. The net metering system will allow customers who produce their own electricity to feed the excess into the electricity grid. Very important. We encourage citizens, Madam Speaker, all citizens without discrimination, we encourage citizens to explore and invest in these alternatives to adopt, to look at sustainable energy sources, to reduce our reliance on traditional source hydro. Madam Speaker, over the past decades, we must all agree that we abdicated our responsibility to invest in this important energy sector over the decades. Now we must work together to remedy, to ameliorate this situation. Hence, our government is working round the clock to find lasting solutions to this historical challenge. We share the pain once more our citizens are going through. But our resolve is to turn these challenges, Madam Speaker, into opportunities to make Zambia an energy surplus country. And it will happen. And it will happen much, much quicker than some think it will happen. We're working very hard. Madam Speaker, in the petroleum subsector, we have continued to ensure security of supply of petroleum products we remain committed to ensuring that efficient supply and stable pricing of petroleum products is in place. Madam Speaker, your government will continue to promote investments and growth of the manufacturing sector. Value addition is very important. We have put in place a legal framework that has provided incentives for the expansion of the existing projects across the country. We are also keen, Madam Speaker, to make sure that all provinces begin to process something, all provinces, so that we can distribute development across our country. Yeah. Madam Speaker, 
Your government will continue to promote investments and growth of the manufacturing sector, as I have said. But diversity is also a matter of importance to us. Madam Speaker, government has continued to use special economic zones as a model for industrialization and job creation. For instance, for instance, the Lusaka South Multi-Facility Economic Zone and the Jiangxi Multi-Facility Economic Zone in Chibombo have continued to attract a number of investments aimed at value addition. We continue deliberately attracting investors in these sectors and once more in these zones, I mean, we invite citizens of Zambia to invest in these zones. Please look at the incentives that are in these zones. A lot of incentives are there. Pay attention, if not for yourself, legal I mean, but for your voters, for your members, for those that are willing to invest. Your government wants Zambian citizens and companies to locate also in these economic zones so that you can be part of the development process. Madam Speaker, to further expand the local manufacturing base, government is promoting the production and consumption of local products. To achieve this, we are developing legislation to support local manufacturers by encouraging public institutions to procure locally produced goods. Public institutions includes parliament. Madam Speaker, public institutions include parliament. Procure from local suppliers. It starts with each one of us. It starts with each one of us. Um, so, we therefore continue, we will continue to promote the proudly Zambian campaign machinery. Yeah. Madam Speaker, government has intensified efforts in economic diplomacy, economic diplomacy, so as to increase exports of Zambian products into regional and international markets. This has been achieved through engaging strategic trading partners in order to remove trade barriers affecting Zambian exports. Soon, we'll address the nation to be more specific on this area. The country will be very pleased with the open market access we have achieved in huge markets, which we can't even satisfy. Now we must produce. All of us must produce. Madam Speaker, micro, small, medium enterprises, MSMEs, play an important role in fostering, yes, 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 I repeat, micro, small, and medium enterprises, MSMEs, play an important role in fostering innovation as well as creating employment and wealth. It is for this reason that your government revised the micro, small, and medium enterprise development policy. Recently, we promoted preferential procurement regulations aimed at sustainability substantially increasing the participation of MSMEs in public procurement. Very important opportunity. Madam Speaker, to support MSMEs, the Citizens Economic Empowerment Commission dispersed 670 loans this year alone. 670 loans this year alone, accounting to a figure of 189.2 million kwacha for small businesses. It's a lot of money. In addition, government has continued to, pro to provide financing under the Zambia Credit Guarantee Scheme. The number of small and medium enterprises accessing financing under guarantees from the commercial banks has increased tremendously. The number of banks through which the scheme provides guarantees has also risen for ease to ease access yeah. with expanded outreach into the rural areas. Yeah. So honorable MPs who occupy rural constituencies, you are not forgotten. Please encourage your voters, encourage your voters to access these facilities yeah. instead of queuing or for tantamen. Further, we are providing empowerment funds in form of grants and loans under the Constituents Development Fund. This year, so far, more than 485 million kwacha has been dispersed countrywide to benefit the youth, women, 
community groups and other businesses. Directly in the constituents. Never done before. We are walking the talk in ensuring that our citizens, especially the most vulnerable, including, including the youth, women, persons living with disabilities, are empowered to effectively participate in the economic development of their country, our country. In light of the above, we call upon the beneficiaries, please pay back the loans because the interests are very low. In some cases, 5%. Please pay back in order for more Zambians to benefit from these initiatives. Madam Speaker, the development of transport infrastructure remains a priority for our administration. This will enhance connectivity and accessibility to all parts of our country, both rural and urban, and into the region. Very important. In this view, in this way, the government has continued with the development of road infrastructure, particularly through the public-private partnership. A model many thought would not work is working now and working very well. We're very proud of this, Madam Speaker. Off the national balance sheet, raising resources off debt, off the national balance sheet. Very smart. Madam Speaker, under the PP model, we have delivered and commissioned 35 kilometer Chingola, the 35 kilometer Chingola to Kasumbalesa Road. Chingola, Chililabombwe, Kasumbalesa Road. In May this year, we also commissioned, commissioned the construction of the 327 kilometer Lusaka Tundola dual carriageway and the rehabilitation of the 45 kilometer Luansha via Fisenge. Masangano Road. Lots of hard work is going in place. We are pleased, Madam Speaker. I'm here to report to you, Madam Speaker, and your house that we are pleased to report that the works are progressing very well and very fast. And the project is being undertaken, Madam Speaker, at a mere $650 million as opposed to 1.3 plus interest, $1.8 billion. Big difference. Three principles, Madam Speaker, the right price or cost, number one. Number two, timely delivery. Three, quality. Quality. That's what we said years back. It's working now. The project is expected to be completed within 36 months. On time. We're working to push for that project to be done even ahead of time. Yeah. Very important. This is what we call value for money. Yeah. Right price, to repeat, right quality, timely delivery. Yeah. The project will contribute to actualizing our aspiration of becoming a transport and logistic hub in our region. Yeah. We are a land-linked country, Madam Speaker. We should never use the expression that we're a landlocked country. We're a land-linked country. Flip the coin, risk on this side. Flip the coin, opportunity on another, on another side. Yeah. Madam Speaker, through other financing mechanisms, government is implementing the U.S. $270 million transport corridors for economic resilience project. Under the project, we will rehabilitate 238 kilometers syringe to Mpika Road. We will also upgrade the Nakonde border post into a modern international non-stop border post. As we, I'm sure, Madam Speaker, people have not heard, we were priding ourselves of a, a one-stop, but we want to move towards a non-stop border post. But for now, one-stop border post in our transition to a non-stop border post with technology is possible. Your government is also working on the Katete Chanide Road yeah. in Eastern Province, taking us to that border post with a modern border at Chanide. Excellent. Excellent. 
Excellent. Madam Speaker, we also commissioned the rehabilitation works on the Lusaka Mongo Road from Tata Yoyo Gate to Katunda Lukulu Junction, covering 87.3 kilometers. In addition, the north, south, and the Reslam corridor, Madam Speaker, will be transformed into a multi-model smart transport corridor with a quality infrastructure and the logistics facilities that we're working on. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, a good rural road network is equally critical to our development agenda. During this period, under review, Madam Speaker, over 2,980 kilometers of feeder roads were rehabilitated yeah. and maintained by local authorities throughout the country. Yeah. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, here is a connection. This has been made possible through the Enhanced Constituents Development Fund that your government is providing to all the constituencies across the country. Further, 186 kilometers of feeder roads have been rehabilitated under the approved or improved rural connectivity project. Madam Speaker, the development of aviation infrastructure and, other, and, and, and another is another strategy. Let me repeat. The development of aviation infrastructure is another strategy we are implementing in our quest to become a transport and logistics hub in the region. To this end, we have embarked on the construction of the second runway at the Kenneth Kaunda International Airport. This will not only make the airport more efficient, but safer. Some remember that we had a challenge on the only runway and some planes could not land here. They had to go to Ndola. Let's assume the plane had no enough fuel. You can't think of that situation. The second runway is inevitable. It makes us more attractive as an airport of international standard. That is very important, Madam Speaker. But we will also attract more international airlines, more than what we've done already. With regard to prov provincial airports, equally important, we are glad, Madam Speaker, very glad to report that the upgrading of the Kasama Airport has been finally completed. Kasama Airport has been completed, Madam Speaker, following the installation of the airfield ground lighting. The runway is fantastic, Madam Speaker. I have used it myself. We are in the process of further upgrades in the northern corridor. We are focusing on the northern corridor because of the distance from Lusaka and other reasons. So after Kasama, we have now moved to Mansa. Work has commenced. Work has commenced in Mansa. Um, from there, Nakonde. Nakonde. We have taken a view, Madam Speaker, that Nakonde is strategic. Uh, to our country's economic investment trade flows. Yeah. And Nakonde must be given quick attention even above, yeah. above some areas yeah. uh, because of its strategic nature. Yeah. So Nakonde, but without leaving Chinsali behind. Yeah. That's the work going on, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, yeah. railway transport remains the most cost-effective mode for the haulage of heavy and bow cargo. In this regard, the government has prioritized the development and rehabilitation of the railway network to improve connectivity at both national and regional levels. The main projects to be undertaken, Madam Speaker, we've worked very hard. We've worked very hard behind the scenes and we've made progress. The main projects to be in, undertaken include the development of the Lovito Corridor, the Lovito North West Railway Line, we call it, from Luau in Angola, through Chibweka, Mwinilunga, Kalumbila, Lumwana, into Chingola. Very important. Very important, Madam Speaker. So this will take us to the Atlantic Ocean, through Lovito in Angola. The revitalization, important revitalization of the Tanzania-Zambia railway system, Tazara, 
And Madam Speaker, we have good news for you. We have signed this arrangement. We have signed this transaction. It's all in place now. And the rehabilitation, obviously, of Zambia Railway, so that that link, Chingola, Kapiri, is joining then Atlantic Ocean and Indian Ocean. Very important, Madam Speaker. Then we are moving towards being a transport hub. Madam Speaker, the information and communication technology sector has demonstrated a remarkable degree of versatility, even in the face of climate change. To drive innovation, Madam Speaker, for improved service delivery and job creation, we are enhancing information and communication technology infrastructure and digital capabilities to enhance digital inclusion and the connectivity in the unsaved and underserved areas. Government is undertaking nationwide construction of 202 communication towers. In addition, the private sector is constructing 212 towers. Madam Speaker, I know sometimes we forget we talked about Starlink not long ago. Starlink now provides internet to any part of this country. Any part of this country, yeah, yeah. you can have internet. It is reality now. It's no longer a story, it's real. Once completed, Madam Speaker, these towers will transform the social economic status of our people. Our people will be able to access a number of key services yeah. electronically, such as what? Social cash transfer agricultural services, legal services, and health services, amongst just some as examples. Further, improved rural connectivity is critical in the attainment of our vision of having smart villages, such as the recently launched Muchila Smart Village in Namala District. This now will be rolled out across the country across the country. That was a pilot project. The concept of smart villages, Madam Speaker, is that we have now adopted, which we have adopted entails the provision of electricity using alternative energy sources, mainly solar, to homes in the villages, to schools, to clinics within the locality of the project. This also includes information and communication services. Very important. Madam Speaker, government is implementing interventions to harness science, research, and development to promote industrialization and green, and green growth. We are enhancing the capacity of the National Institute for Scientific and Industrial Research to facilitate innovation, as well as technological transfer and adaptation. We are also revising the legal framework to provide for venture capital funding for innovators in our country. Further, government is allocating more resources to promote productivity and output enhancing technologies in sectors such as agriculture. The technologies include early maturing, disease resistant, pest resistant, high yielding, and climate smart seed varieties of maize, cassava, rice, sorghum, pigeon peas, as well as groundnuts. We will increase, Madam Speaker, multiplication of the improved seed varieties to make them accessible across the country. Our researchers have also developed a rain-fed wheat variety for the first time to enable small-scale farmers to engage in wheat production even if they don't have the massive irrigation capabilities. Yeah. So wetland wheat, Madam Speaker, will become possible because of these varieties. Human and social development. Madam Speaker, education remains high on our development agenda. Yeah. It is our conviction that an educated citizenry, Madam Speaker, contributes to enhanced national resilience required for sustainable development. To this end, government policies to increase access and improve the quality access to and improve the quality of education. Yeah, yeah. Our free education policy has led to a huge increase in enrollment levels yeah, yeah. across the country. Yeah. Our young people now have a fair chance yeah. to a brighter future. Yeah. 
than ever before. Our young people are now being empowered to overcome poverty. Our young people are now or now have an opportunity to become key players in the social economic development of their own country. Further, our free education policy is helping to curb early marriages, teen pregnancies, and indeed general delinquency amongst our young people, especially in certain parts of our countries, our country rather, certain parts with a high density of population. Madam Speaker, to increase access to quality education for our learners, we have continued to expand infrastructure in our schools. Under the Constituent Development Fund, Madam Speaker, we have constructed 1,551 new classroom blocks, while 322 existing classroom blocks have been rehabilitated countrywide. Countrywide. This brings the total number of completed classroom blocks to 1,883 so far, Madam Speaker. This is tremendous. This is tremendous. Madam Speaker, to maintain our policy that no learner sits on the floor, we have continued with the procurement of desks through the Constituent Development Fund and other forms of financing. Work in progress. More kids enter school more deaths must be brought. So this is not an end process or ending process. It's a continuing process. This has not only improved the learning environment, but also contributed towards employment creation for our people as the desks are now being produced locally. Proudly, Madam Speaker, we can sit here and say we now don't have to import desks as was the case before. They are procured, manufactured, by our local people, yeah. using our local wood yeah. and labor, and the skills under the CDF skills training. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. In our continued effort to improve the teacher-pupil ratio, 7,222 teachers were recruited last year, Madam Speaker. This year, we will recruit more teachers. More. Yes, more teachers and support staff. Yes, more teachers. That's our commitment. And, and, and staff, and support staff to further reduce the teacher deficit and improve the learning outcomes. To all of us members of parliament in this house, let's encourage our nieces, nephews. When they are given jobs as teachers, they must go and report at the schools where they are posted yeah. and work. Yeah. If they don't work, we will replace them. Yeah. And no one should complain yeah. because pupils need teachers in classrooms. Yeah. Madam Speaker, the new dawn UPND administration has embarked on educational reforms. So far, the new national education curricula, curriculum framework has been developed to promote Lifelong learning, lifelong learning, entrepreneurship, and practical skills which our industry, our economy requires. No more teaching anything anyhow. Speaking English does not mean people are skilled. No, the two are different. So we are moving in the direction of appropriate skills as demanded by the economy. Speaking good English is just an advantage, but you need to be skilled in some way. This implies making our education curricula more appropriate, as said, to the needs of industry and the economy, sometimes to the geography of an area. Because, for example, tourism applies in certain areas, so it's important that we acknowledge those geographical differences and offer the skills that are required in the institutions around the, those areas. Madam Speaker, government is scaling up the homegrown school feeding program to cushion learners from the effects of the drought and keep them in school in order to improve learning outcomes. Currently, 
Currently, Madam Speaker, the program is benefiting 2.3 million of our learners in 70 districts across the 10 provinces of Zambia, so the whole country. We will extend coverage for the school feeding program from 70 districts to all the 116 districts. When? In 2025. The whole country. Excellent. Further, to keep the girl child in school, your government has continued to provide free sanitary wear, especially in rural areas where these are needed the most. Madam Speaker, shortage of quality and affordable student housing in our public universities and other institutions continues to be a major challenge, continues to be a major challenge. To this end, government is expediting the completion of stored hostel construction projects in public tertiary institutions across the country. Does not matter who started building these blocks. It doesn't matter which government started doing these things. This government will complete them. Because these are national assets. These are national assets. Thank you. Thank you. We, we will complete this working very hard within the drought challenges, within the energy challenges, we're working very hard to continue, if you like, clearing these one by one until all of them are put into full usable form for our students. Madam Speaker, skills development is key to enhancing entrepreneurship and employability, especially for our youth. We've already touched on this issue. Through CDF bursaries, student enrollment in trace training institutes, and the youth resource centers has continued to grow dramatically, Madam Speaker, dramatically. To enhance quality and access to vocational skills training, we have completed the construction of Lundazi and Porokoso trace training institutes. In addition, Yes, you heard me, Lundazi. Yeah. And in Porokoso. Yeah. And so, in addition, we have rehabilitated 16 of the 23 youth resource centers across the country, Madam Speaker. Further, the national youth policy has been revised and the multi sectoral youth development strategy has been formulated. By investing in education and skills development, Madam Speaker, we are laying a firm and strong foundation for the future of our country. A more prosperous, innovative, and resilient country. That lies in the skills held by our people. Not by magic, not by witchcraft, no. But by skills held by our people. Madam Speaker, as champion of the foundational learning in Africa, this fellow speaking here is champion of foundational learning in Africa, courtesy of the Association of the Development of Education in Africa, ADIA. It is our responsibility to strengthen early learning and education in general, which is the cornerstone to the development of any nation. Madam Speaker, I'm monitoring the progress of countries across the world. All of those that are dealing, doing well, they've invested in education. Heavily. Heavily. It's even easy to implement policies when citizens have some aptitude of some kind. Madam Speaker, the vision for our economic growth cannot be possible without a health and productive workforce to drive it. Therefore, your government remains committed to strengthen access to quality health care for all our citizens, enhancing nutrition status of our people to improve health service delivery at the community level, especially in the rural areas. Government has decentralized also at district level these services. And as we match on the constituents level, yeah. it's a process organized, Madam Speaker, in order, indeed, in order to ensure that we bring health services as close to the people as possible, your government has accelerated infrastructure development in the country. Yeah. 
health infrastructure. Yeah. The government has completed seven level one hospitals. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. And 111 mini hospitals. Yeah. Out of the target of 115, we've completed 111. Not bad. We are now commencing phase two of mean hospital construction aimed, aiming to complete 120 more facilities by 2027. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I must mention here, we are looking at the areas which were not covered. And we want the country to be treated in an equitable way and distribute these facilities across the country, across the country. One Zambia, one nation, one people. One Zambia, one nation, one people. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I have not heard that. I shall continue under your instruction, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I remain committed to the instruction you gave me in the room to continue working. Madam Speaker, government recruited over 3,500 health workers in 2023 alone, in addition to the numbers we recruited since 2021. And an additional 4,000 health workers are to be recruited this year, Madam. This year, despite the drought, Despite all these challenges, we remain committed to the cause of health of all our people. The resource envelope is always small. It is how you use it. It is how you manage it. We choose to manage the resource envelope in these areas that are the most need and will help our country dramatically over the years. So, to be recruited this year, Madam Speaker, I repeat, is 4,000 health workers, yeah. equipping our health service with much-needed workforce. Yeah. Again, patient health worker ratio must continue to come down yeah. so that quality of service can go up. Yeah. Very important. Very important, Madam Speaker. So, to reduce also maternal mortality, Madam Speaker, this House has heard this person speaking here talk about the importance of maternal health. So to reduce maternal mortality, and in line with our earlier pronouncement, the government has constructed 166 maternal annexes in the past two years alone. With 123 completed, out of 166, 123 are complete. So 166 less 123 are on course. Because they all started at different times. You can't complete them at the same time. That's the truth. That's the truth. To further safeguard our citizens from public health threats, the government has strengthened surveillance, detection, and response. We are pleased to confirm that we have taken steps to begin. Madam Speaker, I'm seated here proudly on behalf of the people of Zambia. That the journey we started looking for something is now matured. We have taken steps, and I can confirm, to begin the local manufacture of the Corella vaccine. Local manufacture of the Corella vaccine. Very important to safeguard people and also create jobs. Not the market is not just for Zambia, but for the region, Africa, and beyond. That is what we are doing, your government is doing, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we are stabilizing the availability of medicines and medical supplies in our health facilities. To this end, we have produced 42,000 health center kits and essential medicines under bulk procurement. We are pleased to report 
to you, Madam Speaker, through you, to the House, through the House, to the nation, that stock availability of essential medicines in our health facilities has improved. The stock availability has increased to an, an average level of 85% at health centers, 76% at hospital levels this year. This is above the 75% World Health Organization minimum level requirement. International standards. Going forward, government will continue to strengthen the supply and management of drugs to ensure availability of essential medicines in all our health facilities at all times. Additionally, your government is putting in place measures to safeguard drugs against pilferage. Madam Speaker, we have strengthened the law now. This House has allowed that to happen. You haven't passed the bill. You need to pass it. You steal medicines. You steal drugs. You steal anything that is life-saving. You will go in for a long period of time. For a long period of time so that we can create a deterrent because this is unacceptable. What's going on is unacceptable. Those charged with the responsibility of due diligence and care are the ones taking drugs away from the citizens of Zambia. So no complaints. That is what is called rule of law. Rule of law. So don't say you were not taught. Don't say you were not taught. Madam Speaker, Government recognizes the challenge of men mental health on our people, and we remain committed to implementing measures to address the problem. Madam Speaker, the drought has negatively, as said, already affected the nutrition status of our people living in drought heat districts. In this regard, Madam Speaker, government is distributing high energy, high protein supplements to pregnant women and breastfeeding women, mothers, as well as children to avoid malnutrition. Madam Speaker, we envisage a Zambia where every citizen has access to quality health care and opportunities for health living. A health nation is a wealthy nation. Madam Speaker, prudent management of water resources is critical to building resilience to climate change. Government has therefore continued to implement interventions to develop and manage our water resources. Only yesterday, we appointed a permanent secretary for this ministry, who has been well selected, one citizen, Mr. Kamanga. We wish him well. In this regard, government has revised the national water policy to take into account emerging challenges in the sector. Government will continue to promote water harvesting, Madam Speaker, and other climate smart technologies to enhance water storage and supply. Great attention will be placed on protecting headwaters, water catchment areas, and water bodies from encroachment, degradation, and pollution. Madam Speaker, the drought has also posed challenges in the water supply and sanitation sector. The low water levels have negatively affected most of our major sources of water supply. Utility companies are experiencing drying water sources compounded by load shedding. This, the necessary load shedding, I must say, because if you are hydro-based and you have no water, you have no electricity. There's not much really that we should be debating around this issue. Our attention is to mitigate. That's where our attention should be, to mitigate not to quarrel over load shedding. It is here because of obvious reasons. Let's work together to mitigate and quickly climb out of this problem. Let's take it as an opportunity. Difficult, but as an opportunity. Yes. So, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, this reduced amount of water supplied to our communities is a concern. Human consumption, animal consumption, domesticated wild animals, and really for the vegetation as well. 
grass, trees. We are concerned. We are working hard. Your government is working hard. To improve access to water, government has scaled up the completion of ongoing water supply infrastructure, including that which had stored for over 10 years. We are working hard now to complete these projects. We have continued to implement piped water schemes and also drilling of boreholes across the country. Minister of Water knows this story very well, and we're pushing each other every day, every night, including Madam Speaker, taking out people stealing from the water programs, overpricing on water. It's a serious crime. And some people have been knocked out. We shall knock out more. And no complaints should arise because it's unnecessary. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, providing clean and safe drinking water to citizens is not just to quench the waste, it's not just for industrial use, but it's also a health matter. It's a matter of health, given the needs for sanitation. Madam Speaker, to improve the living conditions of the needy and vulnerable, government has continued to implement social protection programs, such as the social cash transfer and food security packs programs. Under the regular social cash transfer program, Madam Speaker, the number of household beneficiaries has increased from 1,027,000 to 1,311,000 by a whopping close to 300,000 additional numbers. Very important. To further cushion beneficiary households from the effects of the drought, the regular social cash transfer beneficiary households are now receiving a top-up. The regular ones, not the new ones, the regular ones, an additional 200 on top per month for a period of 12 months so they can recover, starting from June this year, Madam Speaker. Specific, very specific. This money is making a significant difference in the lives of our people. And we would like to hear reports, feedback from members of parliament so that we can correct any that which is wrong out there. Madam Speaker, government is also implementing the drought emergency cash transfer program to enhance food and nutrition security under the program, under the program, 952,770 households that experience crop failure and are not on regular social cash transfer are also benefiting. In addition, that is in addition. The cash transfer value for households on this program is 400 kwacha per month for a period of 12 months. Currently, the total number of beneficiary households for both regular and drought emergency cash transfer stands at 2,263,671 beneficiary households. Madam Speaker, please take note of the definition. It's not individuals, it's households, which means that there are more people. More millions of people are benefiting. Work out the numbers, even in the average households, you have five people, multiply that by 2.2 million, 263,671. Quite a lot. As an additional drought response intervention, government is implementing the Cash for Work program, very new program, and I'm very thankful, Madam Speaker, to this House, through your leadership, that approved the 2024 amended budget. We embedded this figure to allow our people to benefit. So thank you to Parliament. Thank you to the members of Parliament. So, 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 as an additional drought response intervention, government is implementing the Cash for Work program. The program is providing financial relief to individuals in exchange for their labor to undertake public works on a temporal basis. 
better to work in exchange for pay rather than tantamen. Because when you work for pay, you produce, you help grow the economy. Very important, very important. We would like to thank our cooperating partners for their support for these initiatives. Madam Speaker, I wish uh, members of parliament and the citizens to pay particular attention to the way these programs are arranged. Yeah. They are thought through. Yeah. We look at many factors, including ensuring that every activity, every money spent adds to some GDP growth yeah. of some kind, especially that we've lost GDP from electricity, we've lost GDP from agriculture. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. So members of parliament, this is important to you yeah. and your constituencies. Madam Speaker, government has introduced the community maize cells. In addition, in addition to what we have articulated, Madam Speaker, the government, your government, your government has introduced, your government, our government has introduced the community maize cells program in deficit areas to improve availability of the commodity, our staple food. Under the program, members of the community are buying maize at 330 kwacha per 50 kg bag from the Food Reserve Agency. We have taken the maize back to the buying depots, closer to the people. Madam Speaker, we had teething problems, but it's coming through. And we encourage this House to report any issues that they experience in your constituencies so that we can address them. Very important. We are a team, one team. We are one team. We are one team. We are one team. So, Madam Speaker, this is what your government is doing as part of the mitigation measures to this drought, to this water shortage, to this energy shortage, to this food insecurity. These are a combined or myriad of measures. By mid August this year, Madam Speaker, more than 92,000 metric tons of maize had been sold across the country on this program. Yeah. We also are providing food relief to vulnerable households in the 84 drought-affected districts. In addition, please, eh, because some families cannot even afford, even after these measures. So we recognize that. So we are providing relief to the most vulnerable households, additional households in the 84 drought-affected districts. And in this area, a total of 40,865 metric tons of relief, white maize, yeah. non-GMO, yeah. has been distributed by mid-August this year. Of this amount, of this amount, 28,755 metric tons were issued to beneficiary households. Madam Speaker, to further address food and nutrition security among the needy and vulnerable households, government is providing basic farming inputs. In addition, basic farming inputs to, vulnerable, to the vulnerable but viable farmers under the Food Security Pack. Madam Speaker, these are add-ons. They are not this or that. It is this plus this plus this plus this plus that so that we can am ameliorate the needs of our people. This is what it is. So, currently 242,000 beneficiary households are being supported out of the number 200,000 are under the rain-fed component. And surprise, surprise, Madam Speaker, 40,000 are under the wetlands component, which were never utilized before. But under your government, we have seen an opportunity in utilizing the wetlands. Yeah. So we are now moving fast to use the wetlands. And the wetlands component really is one great opportunity for our country. And so we want to grow this area more and more because of the water and the moisture that is naturally held under the wetlands. So we can produce something rather than just watching and burning things over the top environmental sustainability. Madam Speaker, our natural environment and ecosystems have continued to be under threat 
we have witnessed increased incidences of adverse climate change effects, such as droughts, flash floods, and extreme temperatures. This has been compounded by the unsustainable exploitation of natural resources. Madam Speaker, to enhance preparedness and resilience of our communities to the impact of climate change, government is strengthening early warning systems, early warning systems. In this regard, over 200, over 200 modern weather stations have been installed in all the 116 districts and around our major water bodies. Very important. The Speaker and the House may remember early into our term we talked about weather forecasting. This is it. This is the investment we're making in this area. We will equally ensure that our farmers are provided with information on the weather in a timely manner. Already the information, Mr. Speaker, has started coming out, how this season is looking. And Madam Vice President, please relocate those people in the low-lying areas. We don't need to take the helicopters during the floods, high floods. Let's relocate them now because we know what is coming. We know what is coming. That is the value of weather forecasting and the investment made in these areas. So I think it's important our people resist, but they must be educated. Otherwise, we'll, we don't want to lose lives. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to lose lives. Uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, um, government will continue to implement the integrated forest landscape project in Eastern Province. Let me repeat that. Government has continued to implement the Zambia Integrated Forest Landscape Project in Eastern Province of our country. We are also implementing the Transforming Livelihoods for Resilience and Development Project in Luapula, Muchinga, and Northern Provinces. So these programs will continue. Madam Speaker, they are very important, extremely important. And your government is committed to making sure that these programs succeed and will carry the communities in these areas to change habits, including farming habits, which are important. That's why we are providing implements, we are providing other things so that habits can change to restore our environments. To conserve and protect forests is a necessity. It's a necessity. We have therefore established 10 community forest management groups covering an estimated 183,000 hectares of forest, while 515 hectares have been put under natural forest regeneration. Further, 26 hectares of land has been planted with 21,000 pine trees, seedlings, which are generated from this country. This is in Mpulungu district where we are focusing on planting pine there. There's a scientific, there's a scientific reason why your government has selected Mpulungu. Yeah. And uh, it's important that uh, this project succeeds and the Mpulungu member of parliament, yeah. our colleagues around Mpulungu, yeah. let's support this project. Yeah. Yeah, let's support this project. Um, and also, Another location that has been carefully selected for scientific reasons is the Nsama district. And here we are looking at 7,300. 7,300. In Eastern Province, Madam Speaker, 72,800 hectares of forest has been planted, placed, sorry, placed under land management uh, practices. A lot of this degradation is going on in that part of our country. And so this project, Madam Speaker, is extremely important to address the degradation um, in that part of our country. And so we also want to ensure that, we we'll continue to ensure that communities are brought on board and also monetary and non-monetary benefits are offered to win off communities that are dependent on certain practices. We recognize that as well. So some of these are based on old age traditions and we need to be able to be conscious of these issues. So your government is making these interventions, Madam Speaker. It is gratifying to note that our people are increasingly adopting alternative livelihoods, such as beekeeping, livestock, 
production, small, large livestock, yeah. and vegetable production throughout the year. Yeah. Throughout the year. No planting month, because every month is planting month. No harvest month, because every month is a harvest month. Madam Speaker, to reverse forest and land degradation, your government has placed 7.6 million hectares of forest under sustainable forest management. The forests have been designed as community forest management areas and are being managed by over 284 recognized community forest management groups across the country. Madam Speaker, this is important so that we can have a sense of ownership by the community. And when the community feels they own these programs, they will look after them, the programs will succeed. Very important. Similar to poaching. So we urge our traditional leaders, civil society, the church, our partners, we call them our partners, to collaborate with government agencies and local communities to help sensitize our people to desist from bush burning. Too much bush burning, Madam Speaker a harmful vice that threatens the ecosystems and exacerbates effects of climate change. Going forward, government will ensure that the livelihoods of our people and the environment are taken as a package and are protected fairly equally. Even as we endeavor to develop a country, even as we want to irrigate, even as we want to water harvest, we will take account of sustainability, Minister of the Green Economy lead us in this way. Human rights and good governance. The rule of law, rule of law, yeah. Madam Speaker, yeah. Yeah. the rule of law, yeah. the rule of law, yeah. respect for human rights, yeah. and constitutionalism yeah. are at the call of our government. Yeah. We are committed to upholding and protecting these principles in totality, yeah. not from one angle, yeah. but in totality. Yeah. The new dawn UPND administration therefore continues to continue to uphold the rule of law. No matter, no matter what is being said out there, we will continue to uphold the rule of law without segregation. The rule of law must be deepened. Our democratic credentials must continue to be deepened, but within the rule of law. Yeah. Right? The rights and obligations of citizens is essential. But every right ends somewhere. But someone else's right begins there. So their rights, obligations, and responsibilities is part of the totality of the rule of law. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Citizens must continue to enjoy their basic rights. But every right, as I said, comes with obligation and responsibility, especially social media, especially social media. Madam Speaker, the Constitution remains an important document for our identity as a people. Let me just reinforce the issue of rights and obligations. Yeah. We have seen social media is being used to damage countries. Yeah. People are hiding behind a cell phone, a smartphone, yeah. to commit crimes. Yeah. This government will take all criminality as crimes. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's on uh, social media, whether it's behind a laptop, yeah. or a platform. You break the law, you are on your own. Yeah. You have seen countries that have been put on flames because of falsehoods. Yeah. Falsehoods are a crime. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Madam Speaker. Yeah. Madam Speaker. Yeah. Madam Speaker. The Constitution remains important, an important document to our country's identity as a people. The country has, however, failed. Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm here to say the country has failed to reach consensus on this very important national document over many years, over many years. As a country, therefore, we still need to reform our constitutional order. 
to ensure that it's truly reflecting aspirations of our citizens. The new dawn UPND government, given the substantial work that has already been done in the past, yeah. and we don't want to repeat that expensive and time-consuming work, this government is committed to facilitate a least cost, efficient, and credible process yeah, yeah, to address yeah. lacunas, omissions, yeah. or oversights, so to say, in our constitution. Yeah, yeah. So we are looking at this house under your leadership, Madam Speaker, to be supportive of a process that will be least cost, that will be time conscious, that will not lead to allowances and more allowances and sittings and sittings that will not do. Absolutely not. Yeah. But consensus building and this house is the one that should help us and we'll be happy to go. After all, some of your constituencies are too big. After all, I don't understand the wisdom how members of parliament were taken out of the council chambers. Yeah. After all, some lacunas can lead us to a situation where we could have no general election for eight years. That's not a joke. Yes. We could have no election for eight or nine years. Those lacunas sit in the constitution. So those who designed or signed of that constitution, I'm not sure what they were intending to do. So, Madam Speaker, you and us and the judiciary, executive, legislature, and judiciary, we are one government. We should work together. This is not a partisan issue. This is a national issue. I urge, Mr. Speaker, that we work as a team. I'm a team believer myself. Thank you. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, we are determined to eradicate all forms of corruption. We are determined to eradicate all forms of corruption. We remain firmly committed to zero tolerance policy against this vice. All suspected cases, all forms of corruption, will not be tolerated, past, present, future, all forms. And there's nothing to hide behind ethnicity, to hide behind religion, to hide behind political party in the fight against corruption. None of that stuff will be tolerated. There is no ethnicity, there is no religion, there is no political affiliation in the fight against corruption. Madam Speaker, I wish to indicate that asset recovery is part of the integral process of fighting corruption. It is an integral part of the fight against corruption. And Madam Speaker, in the last few months only, in the last few months only, your government has recovered over 100 million kwacha cash. I beg your pardon. 100 million kwacha, more than, phenomenally more than, 100 million kwacha worth of property. 56.6 million kwacha cash. US dollar 30.8 million. Cash, cash. These have been forfeited to the state and we are restoring value to the true owners, the citizens of Zambia. The figures are there. The figures are there. Should you wish to know, Madam Chair, from one individual we recovered over $25 million. One individual. So this house must be united. This house must be united on the fight against corruption. This house must be united. 
And I want to say to you, through you, Madam Speaker, we started slow because the laws were weak. We amended the laws. We started slow because the court procedures were weak and they were being abused. We looked through, we amended those. The fight against corruption and recovery of assets has now gathered speed. You will see more. A lot, this is nothing. This is the tip of the iceberg. You will see more. Yes, it's in public domain. It's in public domain. Didn't we, didn't we take a motor vehicle only two days ago or three days ago? We did. 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 And when I say we did, all of us, because this is government, and parliament is part of government. So, Madam Speaker, we want to thank you, the members of parliament, for allowing the legislative changes that we pushed through once we realized the difficulties and also the learning points that we did by sending our teams around the region, around the world. And we're doing fine in that area. So please, no ethnicity, no religion affiliation, no political party affiliation, no cultural heritage affiliation. This fight will continue. And let's just work together. And you will see how many more desks we buy and uh, the hospitals we build. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, a demonstration, as a demonstration of our administration's commitment to fighting the vice, we have launched a revised national policy on anti-corruption early this year. We did launch it. The policy is among other guide, guiding principles, including the reforms of the law and practicing guidelines in the judicial processes. I know some people didn't pay attention when we were making these changes, but this is the result of these changes. Test of the pudding is in the eating. Uh, we are placing a premium on morality in our country. It's very important. And I hope voters will begin to make those decisions to take account of morality as well. Because it's creating problems to elect people into public offices who are supposed to protect public resources but are in the forefront of damaging public resources. It's not a good thing to do. So morality is important and also creating disincentives, disincentives that will make it not attractive to corruption. This House will be required to support those changes. We will continue to fight the past, present and the future. Please, you know anything in the present, don't shout. Don't put a social media article. Report to the police. Just report to the police. That's the best thing a civilized citizen does. Don't go into social media, allege. Go to the police. Go to the DEC. Go to the ACC. Go to anyone, including the police. And your matter will be appreciated, your report, and be actioned. Madam Speaker, to enable our country benefit from international cooperation, and foreign relations, government has continued to ensure that bilateral trade, economic and technical cooperation continue to be the hallmark of our foreign policy. Our foreign policy, please, the House and the nation, is anchored on two pillars only. Peace, security, stability, on one. On another, economic diplomacy. That's all. Very simple. When we apply this, it will deliver results. It's already delivering results. If you look at the restructured relationship we have with countries, excellent. Investments coming in, excellent. Value coming in, excellent. Madam Speaker, let us work together in this area. You are all diplomats. All members of parliament are diplomats. All members of parliament are diplomats and must push the country's foreign policy as you travel around, in your committees, in other work that you do. Madam Speaker, I would like the Minister of Foreign Affairs to work closely with you to interpret these two pillars so that your members of parliament can bring value back home 
whenever they travel outside this country. Yeah. It's a very important issue. Yeah. It's not a small issue. Yeah. I do follow what your members do yeah. when they go out, yeah. their presentations, the work they do. I think we can support them even more. Yeah. That is my request. Yeah. That's my request. Yeah. Mm. Madam Speaker, we effectively, we effectively, as a country, we play our part in the region. First, your government will continue to create strategic partnerships. Yeah. This is a hallmark of success in a modern civilized society. Yeah. Networking, yeah. partnerships, yeah. very important. So we'll continue doing that to promote trade, investment, facilitate high level engagements to attract investments. Yeah. Madam Speaker, the work we've done in this area speaks for itself. Yeah. The resuscitation of the mines is from these strategic relationships. Yeah. Yes. We have a big day for Mulungoshi, Madam Speaker. I'm not listening to it. We have a big day for Mulungoshi. And the nation will be very happy about it. We have a big day for Mulungoshi. So I, 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 was, I stay away from the temptation. But I want to emphasize your government will continue to create strategic partnerships in the region, on the African continent, in the global community. And to, in order to facilitate the re-entry of our country in the League of Decent Nations, in the League of Decent Nations, and also to promote investments, trade, partnerships of all types, as long as they add to a job for a Zambian, as long as they add to a business opportunity for a Zambian. It's very important, Madam Speaker, and MPs must be part of this agenda. All of the MPs. Yeah. When we're here, we don't distinguish UPND. <laughs> one. We are one. We are one team. We are mature enough to distinguish when we campaign for elections and when we save the people. Once we are elected, Madam Speaker, we are here to save the people. Chap, uh, sorry, uh, that's our member, I mean, that's all. I apologize, I mean that's all. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, we effectively presided over the SADC organ on politics, defense and security cooperation during the time we were leaders as Zambia during which we fulfilled SADC's mandate of promoting peace, security, and stability in the region and ultimately creating economic opportunities for our own country. That's how it works. We successfully led the SADC electoral observation mission to Zimbabwe during our chairmanship. Zimbabwe, Eswatini, Madagascar, Democratic Republic of Congo, Lesotho, Eswatini. Did I say Eswatini? Yes. Lesotho, South Africa in our one year of leadership in this troika. We call it a troika. Where we contributed towards enhancing democracy and good governance for our region. Peace in Zambia is important to the region. Peace in the region is important to Zambia and to the globe. This is who we are, Madam Speaker. This is what we stand for as a country since KK's time. This is what we will continue to do going forward as a people. Madam Speaker, the media plays a pivotal role in promoting good governance, as well as informing, educating, and entertaining our people. We cherish the fourth estate and remain committed to freedom of the press and freedom of expression. Our people, Madam Speaker, are now free to voice their concerns without fear of retribution when they do it within the law. But when you break the law, it's a different issue. It's a totally different issue. So I think it's important to, to say so. We have increased the civic and democratic space. No question about it. Madam Speaker, not a single media institution has been closed down for political or other considerations three years down the road. Not one. Not one. 
not one. This is very important. Uh, since we assumed office, not one has been closed. Rather, there has now been more community radio stations, more television stations that have been opened and are operating freely. Anyone who attacks a radio station, a television station, will not hide behind a political placard. They will not hide. When they do it, the law will take course, madam. That's how it works. That's how it works. We have put laws, but criminals still steal. When they steal, we go for them. So when you attack a radio station, we go for you. That's all. That's the difference. Before you attack, you are protected. Now you attack, the police will follow you. In Impica or elsewhere. So just don't do it. That is what we are saying. So I think the distinction, Madam Speaker, must be that they, no one says there will be no criminals. We are saying when you, make, you commit a crime, the law will visit you. Unlike before you make a crime, the law, pro the, the, not the law, the, the politics protected you. We shouldn't do those things going forward. But when you see a crime being committed, just report to the police. If there's no action, raise the issue now to a different level. I think that's what we're saying. That's the civility we're looking for. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I don't want to belabor this point. I'm a cattleman. We enhance the crime, crim, crimes against thefts. People are still stealing, but they're being arrested. I think that's a distinction, very important distinction we must make. People are being arrested. Yeah. So, political players, civil society, churches, other stakeholders, media itself, let's act responsibly, all of us. Let's act responsibly. Freedoms doesn't mean abuse. To enhance access to information, the Access to Information Act of 2024, Act number 24 of 2023 was enacted, Madam Speaker. The legislation enables our citizens to access information from public institutions. You can now go to a public institution and ask for information. You should get it. With these freedoms, we urge citizens to avoid abusing, I repeat, social media and other media. You have seen countries go down in the last two months, three, three months. Those countries will never be the same again. Street fights instigated by falsehoods through social media, serious crime. And we'll be asking this parliament to enhance the laws and the punishment. We want to learn from the new British Prime Minister. He's done a great job. Deepen the law, quicken the prosecution, and people are locked up. Because you can put fire to a nation from a smartphone based on falsehoods. When the falsehoods are, are now found to be falsehood, the nation will be burning. So if you run, want to run a country, what country will you run which is in smoke? Madam Speaker, some of us endured a lot in the past, but we never asked our supporters to go in the streets. Not a single day. No leader does a thing like that. No serious leader does a thing like that. I'm following, I'm listening, I'm watching people enticing young people to go in the streets to go and do what? To kill fellow citizens? To burn property? And then you want to lead ashes? God help you. This parliament must deepen and enhance the laws and punishment and expeditious prosecution. Maintaining freedoms, but acting on criminality. I know what I'm talking about, Madam Speaker. We are, t we are, we are talking globally. We are talking globally as responsible leaders. And we are agreed that this should not be the way the world evolves because it will destroy things. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, 
let us move as a nation, not as pieces and bits, but as a nation. That's the way to survive, even under drought. That's the way to survive, even under load shedding. We move as a team. We move as a country. Madam Speaker, we have continued to devolve public services to local authorities. This program will continue. This program will continue. As you are aware, Madam Speaker, by December this year, agricultural services, livestock and fishery services, as well, in addition to already the devolved services, will also be moving in that direction. They'll be moving in that direction. Community development, social welfare are already there at the local level. So more services will be put, Madam Speaker. We will bring the number of devolved functions to 13. This is supported with resource allocation as appropriate. You can't devolve without resource allocation. Then it becomes playing with words. That's why we are very happy with the CDF, Madam Speaker, and more will be done in that direction. We are taking decision-making closer to the people and enhancing their participation in local development based on their priorities in those areas. You want to clean a canal? That is what is important to you. You'll be supported. You want to plant in a dumbo because you have dumbos in your area? You'll be supported. This is what this government is all about. Madam Speaker, the Enhanced Constituent Development Fund really, 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 to me and to these MPs here, please, if you want to be a successful MP, utilize the CDF properly. That's why I want you to go back to the council chamber so that you can be part of the planning, allocation of resources, but also implementation and monitoring. So, Madam Speaker, that's why we need to amend the constitution to take your members of parliament back to the council chamber so that they can be truly be monitoring these developments. And when we allocate more CDF, which we will this year, you can use it better. Where there are mistakes, take note of those mistakes and raise them and they shall be dealt with. I think that's what we should do as a, as a family, as a Zambia United Fund. Unity in diversity. Madam Speaker, the new dawn... Nakabiri? Sorry, I'm saying again, Madam. I apologize. I'm saying, Madam, I think people have heard. Message is clear. Message is clear. Madam Speaker, we have noticed the slowdown in the uptake of CDF in certain constituencies, which appears to be deliberate. You are not injuring UPND. You are not injuring HH or the Speaker. You are injuring your own voters. You are injuring your own voters. Why should a child in one constituency be sitting on the floor when the money for desks is there? Why? I, I think my age, Madam Speaker, is that let us distinguish pettiness from seriousness. This is a serious developmental issue, and we must deliver in all constituencies. I am hoping, Madam Speaker, Minister of Local Government, we can devise an obligation, a legal obligation for members of parliament to deliver on the development for their people, irrespective of which party they come from. And last time, Madam Speaker, I asked for a meeting of members of parliament. Others didn't come because they're not UPND. No, that meeting was a meeting of the president and all members of parliament so that we could discuss the challenges around CDM, yeah. the challenges on some of the things yeah. that your government should address. Madam Speaker, I make an ask that this is not partisan. CDF is not partisan. CDF is not partisan. Decentralization is not partisan. It's for the people who we claim to save. So let us work together.
Madam Speaker, the new Dawn administration values the role that our traditional leaders play in our development efforts. As such, to uplift their conditions, their status, their dignity, traditional leaders, we have made a special provision under the CDF for the construction of chief's palaces. We are currently constructing 110, 110 new chief's palaces across the country. Good progress has been made so far, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, our quest is to promote gender equity and equality across the country, across social status, and the speed access to justice for victims of gender-based violence is what we are working towards. Speedy access to justice. This year, new courts have been constructed in Solwezi, Kasama, Mansa, Chinsali districts. This brings the number of gender-based violence fast-track courts in the country to 10. Let's utilize them. Madam Speaker, government will continue to promote a good governance environment in the country will ensure that the policy, legal, and institutional reforms are strengthening. Madam Speaker, we proudly salute our talented sportsmen and women for flying the Zambian flag high. Over the past year, particularly during the world's greatest sports spectacle, the Paris Olympic Games 2024. Special recognition goes to our resilient women's football team, the women's football team, who bravely faced off against some of the world's top teams, our women worked hard, made us proud. We cannot ignore Muzala Samkonga, who brought immense glory and pride to our nation by winning a bronze medal. And we also commend the outstanding performance of other Olympic competitors across the disciplines. And Madam Speaker, I won't preempt but we have a program for Mozala and his relay team. Yeah. And, and the nation will be proud to know uh, what we're doing around there. Very shortly, the Minister of Sports will deal with that. Yeah. I must say once again, sport has once again proven itself to be the greatest unifier of our nation, showcasing its potential to not only bring people together, but also provide employment opportunities. Yeah. Through sport, the witness to, we witness, through sport, we witness the best of the humanity, the human spirit, determination, perseverance, and triumph. Madam Speaker, as I move to conclude, Madam Speaker, as a country, we have made significant progress in many spheres, despite the challenges we faced, unbudgeted challenges, especially the drought. Our nation has experienced the worst, harshest realities of the negative effects of climate change. Never seen before at my age, Madam Speaker. I grew up in a village. I've never seen a year when we never harvested. This is the first time. Never seen it before. But despite that, your nation moves on. Your government, your nation, your people move on. Madam Speaker, milestones attained under restructuring debt restructuring. I shall repeat, this is important. Madam Speaker, the milestones attained under the debt restructuring have given us fiscal space to place our economy back on track. Were it, were it not for the drought, we were going to hit a significant growth this year. But we will turn the drought into an opportunity. I already raised that issue before. Irrigation, diversity in energy, resilience, research, all of this we may have not done without a drought. But the drought has given us a plift out of the coin, which is the opportunity. The revival of, of our minds, Madam Speaker, on the copper belt has gained traction. Some would like to say, this new dawn UPND government has a knack for bringing things from the grave back into life. 28 shaft is one example, Madam Speaker. Difficult environment, but we keep on soldiering on, making progress. 
the restoration of hope and resurgence of economic activities in our mining sector, mining towns, as I said, Mopani, Konkola, 28 Shaft, Mingomba, several others, Northwestern, Super Pit, Lumana, First Quantum, Nico Mining, all of these are reviving normalcy into our mining communities. Not just that, suppliers, contractors, go to the copper belt now, Mufrila, Mafken, suppliers have been paid. There is, there is an MP, Madam Minister, sorry, uh, Madam Speaker, the MPs for Mufrila, from different parties are doing a good job. They are working together to help revive Mafken. Mafken is Mufrila, Madam Speaker. So they are working together. Yes, they have differences. They have differences, but they are working together. Yes. One, two, where is the third one? Number three there. Teamwork, Madam Speaker. To drive this country forward, we need to work together and override small petty differences and focus on what we can do together. Very important. Very important. Madam Speaker, this is a signal that lives will be better on the Copper Belt and Zambia. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. Our fight against corruption and recovery of assets is on course. Delayed in the beginning, but it's on course. We are equal on course in empowering our people through the decentralization agenda. Madam Speaker, as citizens of this great country, we owe it to ourselves and the future generations to rapidly enhance our resilience to natural and economic disruptions. Yes, climate change presents us with a challenge or challenges. More importantly, it's an opportunity. Depends on how your brain is framed. It's an opportunity for us to devise solutions to our challenges. It's a call to action, Madam Speaker. It's a catalyst to innovation, Madam Speaker. Let us seize this opportunity to find solutions to build a sustainable future. Let us harness the power of national unity, Madam Speaker. The power of national unity. Demeaning, miniaturing differences. The power of national unity. Working together in this unitary state, indivisible Zambia. Let us nurse this power. Let us collaborate with determination. Let us embrace sustainable practices, invest in green technologies, and empower our communities to adapt and to thrive. Madam Speaker, a prosperous and a better Zambia is not a mere dream, but a tangible aspiration within our reach. I am confident, Madam Speaker, that in five, six years from now, this will be a different country. I have no doubt about it. And I want us in this house to believe in ourselves where we fall short, someone will lift us within our country. If not, within our region, within our continent. We'll bring the skills required to make this country achieve its aspirations. This country should not work against anyone. This country should work for everybody. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, we must commit to working together and embracing an inclusive and shared future. As we tackle bad habits of the past, we must embrace each other. And when we tackle bad habits, we're not doing it against anybody. It's to make society better. To make society better. We have a shared future, Madam Speaker. We must commit to saving our nation and the integrity of our humanity. We must continue to commit to and be passionate about building a peaceful, united, and prosperous Zambia. 
with determination, resilience, and hard work, let us build a Zambia that stands tall as a beacon of hope for generations to come. Yeah. Even when we are long gone, yeah. our great-grandchildren should say there was a team yeah. that turned the corner. Yeah. If you go to countries like China, they will tell you we turned the corner in that year, yeah. in that period, yeah. and they've never looked back. We must be proud and look forward to this opportunity that God has given us. Yeah. These things are only given to us by God. It's only God who designed them yeah. because it's beyond us. But let's maximize working together. Let us build a Zambia that others after us can build on. Building blocks can stand on. Let us be the shoulders. As we said in the theme for 60th, before I go there, Madam Speaker, we need to accept that. We can only achieve this through smart work, hard work, 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 and more work after work. It's the only way. There is no other way. There's no other way. I argue, Madam Speaker, there is no other way. There are no shortcuts. We have to do what is right. And that, if we do, we will succeed. As we said in the theme for our 60th anniversary, Independence Anniversary, let us honor our heritage and embrace our future. Madam Speaker, it is now my honor and privilege to declare the fourth session of the 13th National Assembly yeah. officially open. Yeah. Madam Speaker, God bless our country, Zambia. God bless our people. May God's grace be upon us all. Madam Speaker, I thank you.